Uh, good morning, everybody. Can I welcome you to the 16th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015? Can I remind everybody to make sure that all electronic devices, particularly phones, are switched off at all times? Our first item this morning is to continue our evidence taking on the Education Scotland Bill. We will take evidence from today from two panels of witnesses, the first of whom will cover the Bill's provisions in Gaelic. Uh, and some of the witnesses will speak uh, in Gaelic today, and headsets are available. Uh, and should be therefore uh, hopefully available for everyone in the public gallery. Can I welcome this morning Ian Camel from Borna Gaelic, uh, Kenneth Murray from the Highland Council, Margaret Wentworth from Common Man Parent, and John Wilson from East Ayrshire Council. Um, I'm going to move straight to questions, um, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Siobhan. Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Good morning. The policy memorandum for the bill states that the main policy aim um, is to promote the growth of. Gaelic medium primary education. In oral evidence, a Scottish Government official stated that, and I quote, I am confident that the bill will lead to faster growth in Gaelic medium education throughout Scotland. I'm just wondering if you agree with that statement. I think the bill, as it stands, gives an opportunity for Gaelic medium education to develop, but I think we must look at how we give support to early years and secondary education. Early years education is a foundation for children coming into primary and then to, to give support to the parents. There must be a link between the three areas of the high school. We need to develop Gaelic medium education from early years right through to secondary level. I agree with that. Chairman. If the council or any council is going to put money into the Gaelic, that there will be investment in the Gaelic language. If the council is going to put money into the Gaelic language, that there will be investment in the Gaelic language. If the council is going to put money into the As parents must say that this bill doesn't create legal rights uh, that we are looking for. Common and parents are looking for development. We think it's reasonable that if there is a reasonable demand for Gaelic education, parents should have so we don't see that there's anything here to stop local authorities uh, discontinuing support for parents who have children in Gaelic medium education at any level without that commitment. So can I just say to the panel members, don't touch the, the buttons in front of you. It will be dealt with. <laughs> Convener, I concur with what's been said already, with a particular importance on the need for um, solid work going on in the early years. Evidence shows that um, language learning has taken places at the very early years with, um, with immersion where possible. And I'd also like to think about the links with the one plus two language learning initiative. Thank you. It seems from the answers, obviously, speaking about early years, the legal right um, and, and marketing, I think, you know, um, from the Council's point of view, that any growth coming 
as a result of this bill? Do you think it would come as a result of this bill or because of another initiatives that yourselves are promoting or individual councils are promoting? Or do you, or do you see it through this legislation? I think the bill uh, will be useful. I think the or a notion of football, and law, and the government is or nulla, via the Lutkinian, Adwin, Lukins, Lukbrink, Lukbrink, Alec, Artiger, of Gallic, Snismechel, Marhole, Hatavan, Fulham to be in the Gallic, G. Fasti, Tavile, Gile, and Loki, the Geltok, for Scotch and Arik, Susco, either art school. Kimilutsi <laughs> Will be successful in promoting education. education. Fraun <laughs> Karam <laughs> Many questions still to be clarified to support how parents deal with this. I think the bill lays out a strong context, particularly with regard to um, promotion, giving a, 
advice to local authorities in our own local authority are about to move to a brand new build and within that build we'll have a 3 to 18 campus and our Gaelic provision will be within that and have that have that through flow which I hope is very positive um, the, the other things I would like to sort of wrap around that are the um, two aspects of, of resourcing and funding and the money that currently comes um, through the Gaelic specific education grant and the capital fund and we've also benefited from the Gaelic Immersion for Teachers, which also brings me to a concern I have regarding um, the accessibility of staff to be able to meet the, um, meet the need of the, of the uh, expansion of Gaelic. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, we had a debate, I think it was last week, it was Angus MacDonald had a debate on uh, 10 years of Bordna Gaelic and um, three of us, myself and another two Highland MSPs, mentioned the fact that uh, the entitlement, uh, the other two MSPs were elected under the SNP manifesto, I have to say, uh, but the entitlement that was promised in 2007 and 2011 in the SNP manifesto was an entitlement to learn Gaelic. That entitlement has now become a process to assess parental requests. So when I read the information today, I thought that I might have seen some concern from Borna Gaelic about that, but I actually seem to be quite happy with things, which surprised me. Are you quite uh, content with um, what was promised as an entitlement to Gaelic has now, in my humble opinion, been watered down to become a process by which parental requests for Gaelic uh, will be done. And even where uh, an assessment has been made uh, that sufficient demand and resources exist, there is still no requirement for a local authority to provide Gaelic. Uh, so should we, is that the beginning and end of it? Are you concerned in any way that an entitlement has become a bureaucratic process? Could you could be a, 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 a this bill is not a, a process, strong enough. The process, process is fine at a level. But as the bill itself uh, must be strengthened in many sections to make sure, as you say, that this isn't just a bureaucratic process. Unless an education bill is strong enough to encourage parents to encourage parents to encourage parents to encourage parents to encourage to encourage to encourage to encourage to encourage to encourage Process in the hope that uh, we will have legal rights to Gaelic education in, in the future. We don't want to <coughs> spoil the process of the made so far, but the bill needs to be strengthened as many of the sections are weak, and it gives an opportunity to many local authorities not to uh, promote the GMEA or the GMEA or in 2018, not just a uh, and a new no, for, can, 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 dealing with 
some uh, front 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 demand for chasing one part of the country uh, and uh, then have uh, jailed uh, uh, and 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 in two or three years and the natural way of dealing with the shame of the country and the process has to be a speak out about things and you have to be professionality man of a young girl and the world and the small country and the jailed country from the beginning the galley can last to deal with the guilt of the Helen and Sheer and the same way you want to show again Proportionality Tremendous effort. For them to be in the Gaelic errored. Addition, trying to plan a Gaelic education, a plan a Gaelic language plan. We have a statutory plan to give us guidance about GME. They have been approved at a statutory level by Gordon Gaelic. They have been approved. I think that in my area, the very first school that was specifically for GME was built that had to be extended in 2010, now full again, and we're now looking to see how we can perhaps provide another Gaelic school in anybody. In September, we're opening a new Gaelic school in Fort William, and we're currently building a new Gaelic school in Fort William. To be so opened in 2017. So we're working hard and making progress at a high school level and in the arts and the university. And we're working hard and making progress at a high school level and in the university. Capital funding, welcome. Challenges, in fact, whatever comes out, has an impact. If we succeed in increasing the numbers, there needs to be funding and provision like that for for that. I'm just wondering, can one find a screen to find the two forbidden and common parent as they as parent and they they can be like mass salient plus parent and as one of them will be more core legal government to be in the gallery. Ha, in our case, it is not a cast toy and who does the little toy man has corn and the little toy ham more in our case it will be on. A hat toy and who does the little toy far in the little film to be in the gallery. And you'll be all as active as them to be in the gallery. I guess ha that of Caparant and Smarshin, Smarshin is more not in Gabel Fim, Air Corlagal, and it's on the field to be in the Gaelic. Ha, Rutin, a Ian Tuckel, who blacks in a civil hash or Kitchock. I see this more not in Kitchock. Gabel Corum is fast on the film Gaelic. I think that there is an opportunity for advancement. If there is more promotion of GME, not just the Council of Council of Council. It's, it's not just the, 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 the council like Highland, but um, many other organisations as well. Where, in fact, where is appropriate, as they see appropriate, the to be at the General Brosnahig, I guess has seen this more knocking about the rollout, I guess, to be at the General Brosnahig. Things like this will be used, be used as, a, as an excuse not to do anything. You know, the bill sets out a strong context for promotion and where we are locally in East Ayrshire has certainly got that as a very high focus for having, having spoken to our parent groups. That's something that we're going to be moving strongly ahead with. And I'd mentioned earlier with a 3 to 18 campus coming online in the next couple of years, we'll certainly have the capacity resource-wise and not only anxieties, the capacity regarding staffing. We'd also be looking to um, expand around the community um, learning aspects of our provision in order to raise the, the, the Gaelic language learning um, within um, parents and carers to enable them to support their children through their own learning. Uh, can I just say, convener, that uh, I'm very grateful for the progress report. I lived very close to the, the Gaelic school, etc. But I'm, I'm 
so I pray that only Ms. Wentworth answered my question. And my question wasn't answered by the others. But I think given that we're at stage one of this bill, um, there's no point in myself, Dave Thompson or Jean Urquhart, uh, raising our concerns about the entitlement to Gaelic education, where we've got Bordna Gaelic and Highland Council who I've written down, you know, it's an opportunity for process, the legal rights will come in the future. Um, so there's really no point in us being concerned about this if uh, you're quite content. And I do pick up the feeling that, apart from Margaret, you said should be a legal right, but uh, it would seem that the three MSPs that I'm talking about are on the wrong track here. Um, so if you're quite content with the process of the bill, if you're quite content with the administration that's being required in the bill, then I really have no further questions for you. Thank you. That's not quite what we meant. Uh, I think we all want to see legal rights for Gaelic Medi-Medi-Kiki, but there is a time for that to uh, be established. And I don't think we're at that point that we have full uh, statutory rights for Gaelic Medi-Medi-Kiki. We have taken steps towards that, but we must be careful that we, that we don't uh, abandon this uh, situation we have. We're not, we're not against uh, legal rights for parents to GME, but I don't think we're at that point at the moment for various reasons. Just to add to that, uh, if we <coughs> create a legal right at the moment, the first uh, question is that we would ask is it possible to achieve that? Is it possible to, to deliver? Is it possible to deliver that commitment? With the rights that we have at a national level about availability of teachers and other facilities in Gaelic Medium Education, at this point, as Ian said, we must make a step-by-step -step approach, that's how we see it, and this uh, bill is a significant step in that direction. Thank you very much. Um, Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Good morning. Um, uh, deploying a slightly different track here, um, Mr Murray, you talked earlier on about proportionality and, and while well, the process of considering applications needs to be similar across the country um, for understandable reasons, the approach taken in Highland will be different from, from that in Ayrshire, uh, etc. I, I think that bears out what was in uh, Highland Council's written evidence where you suggest that uh, the process must be flexible and not a one-size-fits-all. In addition, geographic transportation and demographic challenges must also be borne in mind. Any process to assess demand must be based on the sustainability and long-term likely success of provision and the best use of resources. Um, the area I represent in, in Orkney, where there is no tradition of Gaelic education, but it's a very strong tradition of Scots in terms of the Arcadian dialect, um, in, in Shetland, similar, uh, similar um, factors and characteristics are at play. Is there a risk in going down the route of strengthening this right still further, that the resources that are deployed to try and support and expand um, the, uh, and promote the, the awareness and take up of um, Scots language, Arcadian dialect and, 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 and Shetland dialect, uh, could in effect be crowded out by a, a right which is seen as um, uh, underpinned by, by law and therefore um, uh, trumps or is prioritised above uh, that which um, would safeguard and promote um, the, uh, the promotion of, of those dialects which um, I think are struggling to get the attention or certainly historically have struggled to get the attention that they deserve. That's interesting, and I think that's a question that is raised in various parts of the country. Council in Aberdeenshire, who is doing is well used, and other parts of the country. There are difficulties in relation to raising Gaelic to the level that it's at. Can do it, I guess. Has any area of talks a program for the north? Can't do it. 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 Can't do
gives equal respect to all languages and dialects within the Highlands, including Gaelic. Gaelic is mentioned, but whatever part of the Highlands in that these uh, feelings uh, will be taken account of, and that's important that indeed. That is what uh, we have recorded as a council of other languages and dialects in addition to language, but that Gaelic has a particular local uh, application in the Highlands. I don't know if the uh, Arcan Council would have a uh, requirement for a uh, Gaelic language plan as Gaelic is not historically used there. And the uh, census, previous census, uh, those, the number who uh, uh, are able to speak Gaelic rose by 17 percent, so perhaps there are uh, people in uh, the uh, Mr. MacArthur's uh, turning uh, to uh, Gaelic, but I think at the end of the day, this bill is about uh, uh, Gaelic meeting education, and uh, 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 every child in Scotland uh, must be received education in some sort of language. Uh, so the Gaelic community gives full respect to other areas of Scotland. It's good that there are several languages in Scotland, and uh, the uh, minority language uh, and uh, uh, looked on in a political uh, uh, viewpoint. This bill is about GME and even though the number of Gaelic speakers in Arkham has risen at the last sentence. The Council does not have a Gaelic language plan, and we wouldn't want to put that level of pressure on Arkham or Shetland councils at this point. We're talking about reasonable demand in any areas. Parents have that reasonable demand. It shouldn't matter where they're in. Parents should have the opportunity in whatever area they're in. It's not right that you should have a reasonable demand in your area, but not in another. <coughs> I don't have anything further to add to that. Thank you. Interested in the, in the responses there. I mean, I think um, the concern is we've got a Gaelic, Gaelic language plan. We don't yet, as far as I understand, have a, a Scots language plan. And therefore, actually, the, the protection afforded to Scots, the efforts that have been taken, uh, I think the Scottish Government um, can claim some credit for supporting initiatives uh, aimed at um, promoting, um, in this case, uh, Arca Arcadian dialect, Shetland dialect, as part of the promotion of, of Scots language. But where you have an inequality in terms of um, the, the, the statutory uh, protection afforded to, to both, um, then those parents who may wish to have their children taught in, in Scots or to see more of the work being done uh, at, at present spread more widely will find themselves uh, at a disadvantage compared to a similar number uh, of those who may uh, seek to have their children taught uh, under Gaelic medium education and therefore um, in, a, in a local authority the size of Orkney and Shetland um, both two of the smallest local authorities in the country um, the resources they can bring to bear uh, unlike Glasgow, Edinburgh, even Highland for that matter, are far, far less. And therefore, the concern would be that, that what we have through this bill is something that detracts away from um, trying to promote uh, language provision, um, in this case uh, through Scots, in order to satisfy the requirements of, of, of this piece of legislation. Is that a, is that a justified concern or not? 
I can tell you that the records are in the Scottish Parliament. At the end of the day, it's up to the Scottish Parliament and the representatives here. Plan of Ferrum and Labiamno, Ark Ferrum and Labiamno, and 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 Ark Ferrum and Labiamno, the difference between Gaelic and Scots and Spanish, you know, we're, we're here to focus on Gaelic English education. We believe that there should be a development and expansion to strengthen the language. We've seen that happen in the previous years. We've seen that happen in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. There has been quite a bit of progress in the previous years. In relation to the Gaelic, it's uh, an official language given respect uh, by uh, in statute that it's important that we maintain that uh, status for the language. Okay, then. I should probably declare that I've um, a sister whose children both go to the Gaelic Medium School in, in Glasgow, so for, for, for the avoidance of doubt. <laughs> I'm not sure you had to declare that, but OK. Thank you very much. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Uh, there seems to be a willingness, willingness to grow the teacher numbers in Gaelic education, but what more can be done to improve the availability of Gaelic medium teachers? Uh, this level, there's a number of courses available in order to uh, 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 add more Gaelic teachers to the system. And there are many difficulties we have, but uh, uh, the progress has been made uh, with uh, English medium education, which is a lack of teachers there, and there are many more English medium education, which is a lack of teachers there, and there are many more teachers lacking in English education. But we're strengthening Gaelic medium education little by little, little by little. Als ik van van Valen met je naar Kaar is, wordt die hier teacher komen ze voor Gaelic hekkers in in het Gaelic als een wonderschool. Ach, gaan jullie achter je? We kunnen wel achter het kiet kli checkers Gaelic. Zo, op de andere woorden te naar komen ze ga je naar checkers. Als de partners in kindje kavel. Het doet de kinderen teacher niet even even de toegu. Hij kan een tijd voor een teacher nog goed maken. Heel lang. Hij zat er veel. Hij is daar weer teacher van. Hij is een boos op Markebiu. Hij is kiezen nu de Markebiu. Hij is toch iets in moer aan. Maar je nog kijkt op die. Hij koos zich in het af. Hij is een van de meesters. Hij koos zich aan naar de smoesje. Hij is een van de kanten de academy digital Markebiu virtual school groeg we zijn. Digital academy. Voor om te winnen kan ik hekers kader zijn. Al op een vaatkion. Bij de schoenen, bij de moeder, bij de kinderen, bij de vrouwen, bij de opbrengers, bij de kinderen, 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 bij de kinderen. Could you could be here to let us know how the hours is going on up there? We are making progress, but by bit and it will take time for us to make sure that the teachers are available in both primary and secondary schools, particularly the first school and high school. And we are also going to expand primary education and high school. And we are also going to expand primary education and high school. And we are also going to expand primary education and high school. Many courses are being developed for secondary teachers and must be expanded in order that parents are given encouragement and that the wide range of education is open for teachers. There are opportunities to start. 
One of your, your responses about your concern about uh, not resources and issues, but in terms of teachers in, in East Ayrshire. Yes, that's, that's an, an, ongoing, an ongoing issue for us. Perhaps it's our geographic um, area within Scotland and our Gaelic provision within that. I know that we are um, anxious each year to await the, the, the news as to whether we're going to receive a probationer teacher. And it's on receiving a probationer teacher that allows us really to, um, to fulfil our, our requirements regarding our learning and teaching experience. Um, happily, we have received probationer this year. But I'd also just like to just to say the the how much we appreciated the the, the Gaelic immersion for teachers program. Um, there was ten places available last year, and two of those places were taken up by members of staff from East Ayrshire. One member of staff had a stronger um, understanding level of Gaelic than the other, but they have both progressed, um, and we're looking forward to having them both back now in our schools and, and building. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I have teacher and ha 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 artists, teachers have artists that there have is some progress with additional courses being Something else I'd like to say, we, we must look, find ways that the Gaelic teaching is made attractive to, to, to attract potential teachers. In high school, there are not enough, um, not enough provision for the Gaelic ability to be maintained and developed. So these youngsters are often reluctant to go to the next stage of teaching. In Gaelic. Young teachers are attracted to quite large uh, numbers of classes uh, who have no uh, language skills and you know, these are difficult times for teachers and we must find ways in which we can support young teachers in the classroom. Okay. Sorry, George. Sorry, I was just going to uh, follow on from something Ian said and possibly John could and Kenneth could possibly answer this as well, is the fact that the geographic problems that we have in uh, Gallup Medium teachers, is it very similar or does it mirror the same kind of areas like you said the, uh, your own council has difficulty with teachers in general? Does it mirror both or is it that plus uh, a situation with Gaelic? I think un un undoubtedly where we are in East Ayrshire, if we get a, a young probationer that's coming in that's having successful work in our area, there's a significant draw, as you would expect, perhaps, to the Glasgow Gallic School to label that probationer then to move on to the next stage. And while we are trying to do our very best efforts to make the learning and teaching and the promotional um, promotion um, net network there for teachers, I think that's one of the things that, um, that we suffer from locally. Thank you. We, we have challenges in relation to uh, teachers on the periphery in schools where there might be only be one or two teachers, and that is kind of quite isolating for teachers. Probationer, probationer. Given the um, occasion, solish agus runach and donage agus glasch and is taring uh, lights uh, and fine and skied and hacking. The big cities are something we honour for the ancient. Given the hacking, we have to be honest about that and realise that that might be difficult. The geology, the report, the writings are real. The teaching staff for isolated areas. <coughs> so we, we have to find ways of attracting teachers to remote areas. We uh, instigated a survey last uh, February, uh, February 2014, uh, for all the uh, teachers throughout the Highlands and Rigash, more than 600 responses. responses. And amongst these conclusions, it was about uh, Gaelic skills that teachers have, but just uh, language skills in general. And amongst these conclusions was nearly 60 children who, teachers who were teaching in English, 
who were willing to change, to teach in Gaelic. That was very interesting to us and we were motivated to do that. Rather than wait for numbers to come through the colleges that we already have, teachers in our midst who are able and willing to move to teach in Gaelic. So, when I was in Gaelic, as Maggie said, we have to be creative about this and look at possibilities like that, that there are teachers out there and with teaching books and training books and creative commercial skills to teach in Gaelic, they could be available to us and we have to look in depth at these options. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, George, uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks, Convener. Um, a, number of written, a number of written submissions stated that the bill should not be limited to primary school provision. And I noted in 2014 there were nearly 2,800 primary pupils in Gaelic medium education and another 4,600 primary pupils in Gaelic learning classes. So, with more children leaving primary school with Gaelic, how will they be able to maintain their education in that medium if the bill doesn't cover secondary schools? Well, uh, now, Bethany, could you um, and now me you what she was calling in Gaelic at a sheltering model? Highland coaching uh, be looking uh, at uh, an established model. If children are going to nursery education, then into primary school, school then into high school, school. then into high school, school. But there's no uh, doubt that, that we, we believe, believe this bill to be a wider coverage that is famous in the sector. Look at all the sectors, the transitions that go up, how these transitions work, and the support to these transitions between nursery, primary one, then primary seven, into S1. We see, without any doubt, as has been previously said, that there are weaknesses in GME at the secondary school level. A lot of our youngsters are about a thousand and a half pupils in the Highlands are learning Gaelic in high school, but the numbers of studying through the theme of Gaelic are under 300. So we must look at not only the teachers, but the subjects that we are making available in the curriculum. As far as we are concerned, we would like a reference to be made to all sectors between nursery and high school, and that to be fed into the bill, if that's at all possible. I agree with what Ennis says. I can't just do a wrong thing. Uh, As a home school, we will qualify in primary school. Uh, uh, three to two percent to go on the Gaelic. I was not so good at the end of the year. I was not so good at the end of the year. I was not so good at the end of the year. So, I was not so good at the end of the year. I was not so good at the end of the year. I was not so good at the end of the year. That doesn't happen. I leave a lot of doubts in parents' minds about fullness of the system. If the children are fluent in Gaelic, we will look to achieve the targets that we have in the national plan. The targets set by the government are set by the government. The targets set by the government are set by the government. As many Gaelic speakers at the next census as it was in 2001. So that means a big rise in the number of speakers that the church is defined. So the links must be there between the all sectors so that children coming out of high school are fluent in Gaelic and until that numbers reach the target that we have been set at the second stage of the government. So that means that the numbers of Gaelic speakers and the fichet is only dichet. So a tarakach kama tuuna kahang, a krahu kamoor, is punach ne villa show, is gaun ita largely punskal, is arskal, is mishna gaun fashion, is karam hosto fawn, is galik inzuhu, is vifilam sukhanan. Children are 
uh, have that uh, ability mm -hmm. at high school. Hi, Kerst, I can't stand to have missed not yet. Yeah, right. There is a question in relation to encouragement I about the leafy fake and clam. Uh, high school pupils. Have pupils it's, it's, it's very it's disappointing, disappointing to see them lose uh, their encouragement, uh, them lose uh, their encouragement uh, um, in high school when they move from primary. There are difficulties in high school for youngsters to follow Gaelic language, the restriction on subjects in school. So we have to look at ways in which to support secondary pupils, give them opportunities out with Gaelic as a subject, opportunity to use Gaelic in many ways, but begin to use that through the John Muir Award Gaelic. And other initiatives like that. If they don't um, use their language in high school, they won't be fluent when they leave, and that will be a loss to the system, a loss to the language after having been so fluent uh, in the primary stage. I agree with much of what um, Ken has said, although in my local area we're of a smart, far smaller scale to give an idea. We've got 11, 11 children learning in, 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 in primary. That then translates in secondary to um, six fluent speakers, but we also have 203 S1 learners, 122 S1 learners that are getting that, um, getting that experience also. Um, and as I said about our new campus, a 3 to 18 campus, I do think there's a, there's a definite through line there and it should be seen as 3 to 18 and that's got to be the way that it works out and we can share expertise across sectors. If the, if the bill is, is extended to include secondary schools and given that across Scotland um, there's 11,500 pupils that are, have got some form of um, education in Gaelic, um, how could you do it on a practical basis, given that the numbers are still pretty small? Even in Highland region, they're still pretty small. Get the hand in, uh, All the numbers uh, are low. We believe that when the it's important that strengthen, not necessarily expand, but to strengthen what we have. But we provide in the Gaelic. Also to make sure that if they're coming through GME in primary, whatever they go then, at high school, that there's a time plan for the time for the high school timetable. Um, gives Gaelic effect to the Gaelic. The needs of Gaelic and Gaelic learners uh, statistics show that learners' numbers are very good in terms of Gaelic learners, and that's very encouraging. And I'd like to, but we must look at what is needed in terms of subjects delivered through the medium of Gaelic and also Gaelic. Taught as a subject. Uh, I, mean, I, I agree that there are difficulties, uh, uh, difficulties substantial difficulties. Throughout
I'm assuming um, that the planning to make together, plan together, as the is teacher and as the schoolmaster, as the and I'm assuming the current technology to be used for the future to be delivered. I'm like that's certainly the way that we're planning to, to move ahead, as, as just defined there by, by Maggie, is looking to grow our youngsters in primary, but as I said, more importantly, in the early years and even with our parent and toddler groups, so that we can then get a, a number of pupils in secondary school that have a significant mass, which will allow us then to offer greater levels of timetabling. But um, I also, also agree with the use of technology and um, looking forward to our, our new campus, which will have state-of-the-art technology and making best use of that, that we can get as many learning experiences for youngsters as possible, particularly in uh, the area of Gaelic. And er earlier on, Ian, you talked about um, the early years and how it was important the foundation for, for primary schools. Uh, is there any indication of what the likely levels of demand for Gaelic medium education and early learning and childcare, and what would local authorities have uh, sufficient resources to provide it. Would local authorities have those resources? Well, how does the plan go? I think we're going to have to ask more questions. Across previous years, on, uh, been a great uh, amount uh, of children coming into the early years. Coming into the early years. Traffic is a chief. Uh, responsibility on local authorities to support that area for uh, nursery education that already exists, but there shouldn't be any difference between Gaelic and English in terms of provision, I think more and more demand will come in as this bill is delivered and strengthened up to high school level. I think we have to look at uh, how we are going to make provision available so that the preschool is strengthened. That is where 
um, things begin and encouragement is available uh, for parents and children's learning starts. So a lot of work needs to be done and I'm sure there will be a greater demand uh, once uh, this bill takes effect. And we have to be prepared to deliver these provisions. Uh, we have a specific responsibility as a council so, uh, for the, the preschool sector. We have nearly 30 playgroups in Highland, um, getting various provision in Gaelic from zero to three. That's for as, nearly as 300 youngsters in nurseries. We have nearly 300. But that is um, spread between 25 nurseries. Feeding into Gaelic medium primary schools, we know what's the level of provision coming in to primary one. And what uh, needs to be provided for every year. Uh, uh, director sends out a letter to all parents in Highland who have nursery child going into primary one, uh, encouraging them to make use of Gaelic and Gaelic If there's an opportunity for the local, for the local school is providing GME, then they have that opportunity to choose. GME and P1, and then we'll look at how that feeds into up to primary seven and eventually high school. At the early years uh, level, we have plans for um, the, that sector feeding into primary. Early years is extremely important for parents so that there are links from one sector to the next and for the early years level to be strengthened and developed. That is of keen interest to parents. So Choosing the level of the form of education, that they have sufficient information and understanding about what that means. It's very important that they, they see the next step uh, leading into primary. Okay, so in answer to your question, particularly about resourcing, we would certainly have the resources and what the bill does give us is a clear mandate for pushing ahead with promotion because at the moment we have resources, but we want to build up the promotion to um, populate our early years establishments from primary schools and then see that feeding through into secondary. Thank you. Liam, did you have a supplementary? Just, just on, the, on the secondary provision, I mean, everybody, I think, quite understandably talked about how you, you build up the kind of pipeline of demand through, through the primary and, I suppose, early years as well. Um, but I was interested in the secondary provision inevitably as a concentration you go from more primary schools to a fewer number of, of secondary schools I mean, there's the experience in Highland for example that that has then um, resulted in, in the council concentrating investment on the secondary provision in a number of the um, in the key areas I think um, that as you referred to investment in Fort William and Inverness and Portree I think Tain as well not quite sure whether that was primary or, or, or secondary, a combination of, of both. But it strikes me that obviously I mean, Thurzo and Wick aren't mentioned as, as part of that and, 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 and intuitively you would expect the investment to go into those areas you mentioned. Has that been the approach of the Council to focus the, the investment in secondary provision in terms of, um, of, of what's available in, in, in Gallic Medium in, in those areas of, 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 of strength and numbers? Um, Tapley, Mr. McCarthy, uh, Mr. MacArthur, Conan the Gale talk, uh, Helen Kelly, Philip, and the Gallagher, GME, Fickett Cigar, Boonskull, at 
what kind of uh, future life and prospects are they going to have once they leave school? That's what we're focusing on. Mark. We have a few questions about the assessment process and firstly about the, the consultation. Um, there's a, a consultation process which um, includes Board of Gaelic, Education Scotland and NPFS, um, and there's been a number of submissions that have um, questioned that list. The consultees questioned whether those that list um, should cover those organisations, and um, whether some should be removed and some should be added. Or just to ask members' um, views on whether they think that that list of statutory consultees is sufficient, um, or any changes they would suggest. When we submitted an Irish Kaki in the village, we didn't refer to this at all. I speak to you, Mission. Colonel Tradition, Cohorn, Yanu, Nishin, Nishin, we work with a range of local authorities and we will continue to do that in conjunction with Gaelic education. We have various established committees for dealing with education at various levels and we will continue our consultation with Highland Council and other councils and organisations. So generally we don't have a hard and fast view about who Consultation should be. As would be expected, a common as a process, I saw. Uh, 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 Buinan I guess has in a structure. So we don't have any further views on that process. 
Yeah, the local authority wouldn't have any views differing from those already expressed by Highland. Okay, um, thanks for that. Just to ask as well whether um, members feel that the assessment process is clear or needs to be simplified again um, with the number of sub submissions with um, conflicting views, some stating that it was a clear process and they were happy with that. Um, some um, individual organisations and local authorities felt that the assessment process was, was complex and could be simplified. Just to ask your views on that as well. Um, <coughs> I am proposed to spend a half of the month. The process has um, um, indicated looks a bit daunting. Uh, yes. Um, uh, can you uh, uh, be acting? We have had a meeting um, uh, within the council. Uh, yes. I think we have a meeting within the council. I think we have a meeting within the council. I think we have a meeting within the council. Uh, to bring a kind of uh, easy guide a toolkit together to assessment an easy to the process. To assessment. Uh, I speak over the corporate lecture show. Whoever is working with the process, but could you could offer for the care for the board, the Gaelic and your offer for the other is not the same your parent. Can we put it in the door for the Seller, I guess, Ferris, step by Hamer Hame, a guide for a mega created Ferris, a clerk, and a foot in a big and a way for everybody to use in relation to the process. He should begin the man his name on the Madrid and on my Yen of Frost. And we see how it develops. I'm not skill at my homestock, could you? I think you shout unless you shout or. I should say that we are looking at the we want things to be a simple, clear and easily understood as far as possible to look at the various steps and levels of process. As far as the assessment process is concerned, there are three thresholds. Arguments go back and forth. 
famous in religion. But the bill says about Gaelic uh, culture, famous, uh, uh, teacher, uh, uh, provision. Uh, the um, process must be open for all children in Scotland I'm to learn and use Gaelic. Process I agree that the process, process must be simple for parents, parents to understand and that parents get the appropriate information about the process. Uh, a question of uh, who's going to be deciding in this process. Will there be an appeal process? It's not quite clear. Uh, one or two questions still there left that need to be clarified. Yes, we'd set out that there was a clear process, but I think it also needs to be accessible. That's what we're talking about today. Um, Kenny had mentioned uh, um, a toolkit being very helpful, and I think we would um, reiterate that. Okay, thanks. Uh, finally, uh, with the comments made about the potential for an, uh, an appeal process or whether there actually was one, and that was unclear, and, um, Section 11 in the bill, there's the procedure following the full assessment, um, which is set out. Do you, do members, um, feel that within Section 11, after the assessment has made that there should be an appeal process. For local authorities to say you'll get Gaelic medium medication in second year. Okay. John? Yes. Okay. Should make sure that uh, these conclusions are open. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Can I just can I just ask about thresholds very briefly um, before moving on to another area? Um, the current threshold is five pupils, um, and we've had submissions which said it's too high. We've had submissions that said it was too low. There are submissions that said it should be flexible, and there are submissions that said it should be based on a percentage rather than a, an actual number. Um, that leaves us in some difficulty about what to make of uh, the thresholds. I just wonder to what extent there should be a flex flexible approach uh, that has been suggested in some submissions um, and whether you agree with that or whether do you believe that any kind of flexibility effectively undermines the idea of a threshold in the first place? I think as it's stated, the five is a sensible number, but I think there does need to be flexibility in the process, as in fact, the four of them in Baras, if you want to ask or Edinburgh, so at the end of the day, it depends on the evidence that's provided to the local authorities, and still the local authorities show that the minister has the opportunity to adjust the thresholds if it's believed that that's reasonable. But What's the views of East Ayrshire? Yes, we'd put down that the thresholds are appropriate and um, still stand by that, particularly with the way that we are set up just now with our one campus. Okay, thank you. Margaret, do you have you? I'm a small knock in. Uh, I 
Pech, en je pech voor hem, maar in je koek, dan is je koek in de hand. Als je een koek in de hand hebt, dan is je koek in de hand. Als je een koek in de hand hebt, dan is je koek in de hand. Als je een koek in de hand hebt, dan is je koek in de hand. Als je een koek in de hand hebt, dan established development for the future. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. I'd like to look at uh, what's always a, a difficult area, cost. Um, I notice in the, the Borna uh, response in paragraph 8.2, they highlight that significant investment was needed to ensure the Gaelic education was supported and developed. Um, a number of councils in their, in their submissions also highlighted concerns that uh, providing Gaelic medium education might divert funds away from other, other areas of education. I'd be interested in what the panel feels about whether the provision of GME is inherently more expensive or does it just redirect resources that would have gone to that child anyway? My view, GME is not expensive than English medium that's been true in areas like Highland. As we said, uh, local authorities are under an obligation to educate children in their schools and there shouldn't be any, any difference. The different the cost differences aren't such that it should be used as an excuse not to provide education in to children. Undoubtedly, a great facilities are required in Gaelic education, for example, teacher training, but that, that also applies to English education in these courses also apply. So we're looking at a wide-ranging system. The overall cost should be the same, whether it be in Gaelic or English. Uh, every study that's been done in Hungary are virtually the same between both languages. That is true. Um, that's what we have discovered, although and of course the benefit of bilingualism comes to light uh, very quickly. In relation to cost, um, as far as we're concerned, it's just the initial setup of cost, and that, <coughs> there, are, uh, there is uh, additional support made available by the government for Gaelic. Yes, in relation to costs, there's two types of costs. There's resources and there's, there's ongoing, ongoing staffing. Certainly for, for resources, we're receiving um, funding through the, um, the Gaelic Schools Capital Fund uh, to support our money that's coming together for our new school build. I think as far as classes are concerned, it's maybe to do with class sizes for my own authority being a small local authority. And when we're looking at staffing a school, we're looking at um, the staffing pointage that is there in relationship to our formula set out by the, by the pupils. If we've got small classes just now that are being led by one teacher in Gaelic, then that is obviously a, a, high, a higher cost. But our hope would be that as we develop our early years work, then that cost will be neutralised as classes become closer to the normal, the, uh, the other, other class sizes. I was interested in East Ayrshire Council's uh, submission where they say that the implementation of the duties outlined in the bill would have an impact both in terms of finance and human resources and would there have a, therefore have a consequential impact on the delivery of other educational services. 
was on the basis that um, we'd be looking at um, expanding the number of um, teachers that we would need to have, and that we're looking much further down the line. At the moment, we're in the position that we have got capacity, but taking this bill has been something that is, is for the future and not just for the next couple of years, obviously. Then that was our thinking behind that, that as the promotion developed within the local authority, we would have more, um, uh, more children learning and then um, we would have a bigger staff implication. The financial memorandum states that uh, the additional funding in 2017-18 would be 72,500, rising to 177,500 in 2020-21. Um, presumably, this is ongoing additional funding which will be required in order to, in order to uh, bring these duties in yes. through the councils? Yes. Okay. Other than that, I was going to be asking about uh, the uh, fairly modest assumptions for the establishment of new units. Uh, the uh, financial memorandum uh, estimates one new unit every two years. Is that too modest or is it too ambitious or... Where does the panel see that? Well, it's it's uh, quite difficult to, to, see, uh, to identify what's going to happen in, in the future. Uh, or <coughs> to be <coughs> if we're going to be successful, then we will be marketing the 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 I don't know how successful that will be. Perhaps uh, there will be more. Um, um, we will be more. 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 We will to <laughs> Uh, who knows how successful this initiative might be? I think there will be demand uh, if the, this bill is su successful. I don't have anything else to add, Convener. Thank you. J just, just one last question. We're talking about, according to the financial memorandum, one new unit every two years. Isn't that what we have at the moment? Isn't that, is that, is that actually an expansion? 
There will be development, undoubtedly, in addition uh, to uh, what the uh, financial uh, memorandum says. I think we're I think we're back to where we started. The, this bill is just too weak at the, at, the, at the moment, but it needs to be strengthened if there's going to be advancement. Two members, uh, Mary and Liam, who want to come in, can I ask you to have quick questions and could have short answers as well, please. We're running out of time. Mary. Well, it, it was just on that point in the financial memorandum, paragraph 41, uh, that Colin Beattie has just mentioned. Uh, I notice all the panel members, convener, have uh, talked about an increase in demand, but in, in actual fact, the bill, and I read, there is no expectation there will be a high number of parental requests and uh, Colin just mentioned one parental request over a two-year period. Um, so I'm just wondering, that are your expectations the same as the expectations in paragraph 41 on the financial memorandum? Thank you. We have to remember that this is a demand for a new garlic unit. We have to remember that garlic is already provided in many schools and uh, there are you know, empty uh, chairs to be filled. This isn't just um, uh, uh, de dealing with numbers going through GNI, but new provision, new demand for units. So we already have uh, uh, empty places in some of the schools and have an opportunity to expand the numbers. This is uh, looking at uh, um, new provisions, so it's a, 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 a historical outlook. Perhaps we can see a different picture. At the moment, there are 600 pupils in primary one, uh, an increase uh, last year. Uh, so I think the shouting colours is the chain. Oh, it's a small chain. Has gone up uh, 40 percent uh, over seven years. So if this bill is strengthened, I believe there will be increasing demand. And the numbers will increase as uh, practice has shown in uh, recent years, and that will continue. There is an opportunity for growth if um, additional marketing is done local level and further information is offered. There is an opportunity for greater demand. The, pr the promotional aspects would certainly, hopefully, bring greater demand, which we can currently fill within capacity. Come on to that in one second. Liam, have you got a very quick one? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in terms of the assessment of costs, I think you quite rightly have pointed the need to look at benefits as well. I think all of you have mentioned the benefits that derive from bilingualism. Um, but I think, Mr Murray, you talked about um, really the cost being around upfront capital costs, and yet in the written um, submission from Highland Council, um, it, it states, we would also anticipate additional staff training and development costs to maintain all knowledge and expertise in related continuous lifelong professional learning. Uh, I think it also then goes on to say, uh, another area where significant costs could be incurred is in pupil uh, transportation. And then it talks about the impact this uh, has on additional funding support requirements elsewhere in terms of educational provision. So I think it would be fair to say it's not simply the, up, the upfront capital costs. There, there are uh, other costs that, that you as a council have identified. Now, whether or not you uh, assess those to be costs worth, worth bearing uh, over the piece, but nevertheless, the picture looks slightly different from what you've been expressing this morning. Sorry, 
Koskish and Kogan, and a Jiffet ski transportation uh, cost. Give it my art. I get up Koskish and I do the famous look and the clown, famous look and the varrock. So we did it. Famous look and tyke. Additional. 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 Koskishin should be has a very nice show. I could all of a lot of the Reuters and Nettle. So famous in Charles and Dure. He's famous in the honor of my year. He's a cash from our school to a Kenya. This is a little bit of a thought. It's a little bit of a fact. I guess shouldn't be cool. Not just passing by. Check body. Thank you. Good morning. I think we're all agreed with Mr. Campbell's comment that we wish to see bilingualism in Scottish schools. Before I come on to what I want to ask a question around promotion, provision uh, and support, in the uh, in Margaret's the submission of the Parental Council, we know that from, from the, the submission that the Scotland Schools Act 2000 provided local authorities with guidance uh, as to how they could promote, then, this is 2000, promote Gaelic medium education entitlement, provision of Gaelic education, improving Gaelic education at preschool, primary and secondary, but you are concerned that local authorities have not adhered to the guidance issued. Presumably there was no marketing or promotion of, of that at the time, was there? That's right. Going to um, what uh, organisation is going to um, monitor this and make sure that uh, marketing is done and um, uh, system is promoted to uh, as parents would expect? I mean, I, I hate the idea that we're going to start setting targets rather than look at the outcomes that uh, we're trying to achieve. And on that basis, uh, if I may ask uh, Mr. Murray. Uh, Kenneth, the, the, all education authorities are, are to promote, you know, Section 13 of the Bill, promote GME irrespective of whether or not they currently provide it. How do you ensure that promotion is then, and, and provision uh, follows the promotion, and then support is either there ready for the provision or support follows the provision? What kind of marketing is going to make sure that all of these activities follow in an integrated fashion so that uh, we are achieving your objectives? That's the first question. Second, you talked about proportionality. Why is it we're seeing growth in one particular area? And I know from contacts in the Southern East Ayrshire Council, but in, uh, across the rest of south of Scotland, there is no uh, a rush uh, to uh, have pupils learn uh, Gaelic. So the first question is, how are you going to ensure that promotion is going to be met by provision and provision uh, will have the, the, the desired support. And the second question is, why the difference in proportionality? Why is there no cross-communication as to what we're trying to achieve? And will the bill achieve that? Well, my own school, I have tavern for them to be in the council. I have 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 to be in
Tavern Ras, Fulham to be in the Gaelic, the Rihalishin, Irish, how it tastes at the moment. He had mentioned in particular about East Ayrshire and about the growth of, um, of, of Gaelic in East Ayrshire. We're certainly proud of our um, schools that are providing just now in, on Thank and in, in, in Grange and looking forward very much to our new 3T18 campus. So we're very much looking to the future. The bill has set out a clear mandate for promotion. The other part of the question was about the sort of court cart before the horse regarding how do you how do you promote then how do you realise you've not you've got the capacity whatever I think within our particular local authority we are um, looking to positively move ahead to grow numbers and um, without not wanting to have any care for the governance that was around not wanting to extend ourselves beyond which we can then commit to provide. I think we are just now in a situation, as you pointed out, that we do want to grow. Therefore, we're going to promote in a really strong way, um, grow our Gaelic. Um, yes, you're going to do that through... Um, I mean, we were talking about marketing. Yes. That's great, but yes. how, how yes. are you going to promote yes. I think it's already been mentioned this morning about the key aspect of getting to the um, parents when they've got very children at their youngest ages. So getting to, 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 to parents in, when they're enrolling for early years, already heard from Ken about the, the, the way they do that in, um, in um, Highland, a letter from directly from the, from, the, from the directorate. Also ways of looking in through the parents, um, the parent and toddler group and getting that um, family, if you like, family of, of, of learning, wider, wider known, and then also looking at electronic ways, looking at refreshing the website, making sure the website is accessible, making sure that it is um, attractive, and using other aspects of social media, and using schools, their texting service, and making sure that any way that we can get to parents to make sure that they know about the quality um, service that's available, and to get people to sign up for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can I, can I thank all the panel members for coming along this morning? Um, we are very grateful for you taking the time to come uh, and appear before the committee, um, on, particularly on the Gaelic section of the Education Scotland Bill. Um, we will be moving on to a second panel um, in a moment, but I suspend the meeting briefly to allow a change over the panel. Thank you.
Can I welcome our second panel uh, this morning, which will cover provisions on GTCS registration. Can I welcome Nicola Dudley, Scottish Council of Independent Schools, Rod Grant from the Crifton Hall School, Dr. Da so, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Daniel Hofty, International School of Aberdeen, and Ken Muir from the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, as with the first panel, uh, we're going to move straight to questions from members, and I'm going to start with Siobhan McMahon. Siobhan. Thank you, just wanted to start. Um, the process has moved on um, since when we first looked at the bill, and we're aware that no formal consultation was undertaken on these provisions in uh, advance of the bill. So we're just wondering where you believe the state of play to be. Um, firstly, um, if I can throw that out there. Well, if I could begin, uh, uh, we, we have begun to look at what is required anyway to uh, widen the, the registration opportunities for teachers within the General Teaching Council. And a working group has been set up which has got uh, representation from the independent schools, from the grant-aided schools, from GTCS, looking at how we might uh, transition into the requirements within the bill for full registration of all who are in those sectors. So there is work already underway uh, to look at how we can put in place the measures that are required in order to fulfil the requirements of the bill. And we accept, we've welcomed those discussions which have been very positive to date. I think the, the work that still needs to be undertaken is very much in the detail um, in order to meet the, the diversity of needs within the sector and to recognise the different recruitment needs um, and the very individual needs of some of the, the schools and the, the staff who are in, in employment, but also to meet the future recruitment needs of those schools, um, taking into account the diversity in terms of mainstream day and boarding schools, special schools, international schools and schools, specialist schools and some with a very special, unique curriculum like Steiner schools. So it is a diverse sector with, with diverse needs. What we have done is uh, have someone from the GTC come up and talk to the teachers that we do have registered, talk to them about maintaining their registration, how the new process will work, uh, and are in the process of asking someone to come up to help us with the details that uh, we're most worried about is how do we get people that aren't registered, registered, especially people... Uh, that we'd like to recruit from overseas. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm not talking about the entire independent sector, I'm only talking about my school and my own recruitment procedures, but we do find it um, that we get a lot of applications from outside of Scotland's borders, and it is an extremely difficult process for any teacher to become GTC registered. And so I obviously have a concern about how I now employ someone who comes from England who has to be registered, according to this bill, prior to me appointing. So I'm sure that the GTCS are going to work on that, but that's obviously a major concern for me. And also I would highlight, and this has probably not been mentioned very much, that I personally believe that there are industri industry experts who are perfectly capable of teaching. And I would, be able, I would want the freedom to make that choice in my own school. For example, as politicians, you would probably be very comfortable at teaching modern studies. You might. You might well be able to. I would like to be able to make that judgment, not necessarily just because you're registered with the GTCS, because for me the GTCS does not necessarily mean a kite mark of quality. It means you're registered. I would assume that um, many people might agree that there are registered teachers within the GTCS, of whom there are many in my own school, um, who may not necessarily be excellent practitioners. That's my point. I mean, that's very helpful to set that out because, as I said, because there hasn't been a consultation, um, we try to keep up to speed with this as well. But my colleagues will probably pick up on some of the issues that were discussed there. But I wanted to first talk to uh, Mr Muir, if I could, um, about what the potential benefits, the specific benefits would be and the improvement to pupils um, in independent schools. What can they expect it to have um, from the teachers who are, who are registered and to what extent could attainment, because we're, we're talking about that in a separate inquiry, realistically improve with that? Well, I think uh, one of the things that the Scottish education system prides itself in having is high-quality teachers. And I think to suggest that you can bring someone in off the streets to teach youngsters undermines significantly the complexity of teaching as a profession. So I think there's a guarantee, if you like, by having teachers registered for yourselves as uh, politicians, for the society as a whole, that the, the requirement for registration ensures 
that teachers are first and foremost well trained to deal with that complexity. And there is something in the teaching profession about uh, teachers maintaining their, their, their professionalism through that, that registration. I think for teachers themselves to be registered, uh, there's, there's significant support that's available from, from GTCS. Teachers who are registered are required to undertake professional update. That's an indication that they take their professionalism seriously, that they're continuing to learn and learn as the complexities of teaching change as society and uh, at large demands uh, more and more uh, of teachers. I think registration gives teachers uh, an opportunity to access uh, the, the MyGTCS system, which provides support, research findings, uh, it allows them to log their professional learning, it allows them to access professional learning. So I think there are many benefits, both to individual teachers in being registered, but also to society as a whole. And as a regulator, there's a degree of reassurance to society at large, individual head teachers, that should anyone be subject to our fitness to teach, there's a guarantee that if they are removed from the register, then they are unable to teach in any other part of Scotland or indeed in any other jurisdiction. And that's a particularly significant point just now as we are aware of what's happening within uh, a number of schools in Scotland. So I think there's, there are reassurances to individual teachers and benefits to individual teachers in being registered. There's a benefit to the professionalism of Scottish teachers as a whole, and I think there's, there's benefits to society as a whole in being registered. Specifically to pupils, what's the benefit there? I mean, if I was playing devil's advocate, I would take Mr Grant's point in taking people from different sectors. So we're, we're talking about the Wood Commission and, and how we get pupils to think about different career options and different subjects, to take that um, advanced knowledge from people who have worked in the sector and bring them in. Would that not increase the, the attainment of, of certain pupils? It could very well in some, in some occasions. I mean, I think part of being registered... Uh, is a requirement that folk undertake, that teachers undertake professional update. Every five years they have their professional learning, both supported by GTCS and by others, and they have that uh, signed off. And I think if, if, you, if you look at what makes the biggest difference to the outcome for youngsters, it's the fact that they have been given high-quality teaching, and I think professional update is a means by which teachers are encouraged and supported to, to continue their professional learning throughout their career. And that will have an automatic, it should have an automatic knock-on effect on the quality of the, the, the learning that youngsters then get. I think if teachers continue to keep their, their skills up to date, to keep their knowledge up to date, to have that, in a sense, validated by GTCS, then parents, uh, pupils are beneficiaries of that in, in terms of the, the, their, their outcomes uh, in their learning. Yes. I think we would argue that the professionalism of teachers is of utmost importance to the schools, regardless of whether they are GTCS registered or not. The professionalism of teachers is at the heart of what they do in supporting professional learning. Professional review and development systems have been in place in, in independent schools before professional update, and indeed have been the good practice in, in many independent schools have been recognised by GTCS. But it's not if they're just if they're GTCS registered that they go through these systems and, and support for professional learning and professional review and development procedures. These systems are open to all staff in schools. I, as Continuing Professional Development uh, Coordinator at SCIS, see the uptake um, and the positive response to the, the professional learning opportunities we lay on as an example of the support for professional learning. Schools themselves, um, the teachers go through rigorous, rigorous selection procedures prior to appointment to ensure that they get the best teacher for the job. And bearing in mind that many of these schools are not just looking at the quality of the teacher, but about their commitment to the pastoral care um, in, of the support for the pupils, the 24-7 provision in in boarding schools and the very individual needs of some, key, um, some pupils in, in some of the special schools. Um, and, and professionalism is at the heart of that. And they're under scrutiny from Education Scotland, from Inspections, Care Inspectorate, the Registrar of Independent Schools, the parent body themselves and the governors um, with responsibility for, for managing the performance of the schools. Um, so those teachers, are, whether they're GTCS registered or not, the professionalism um, is taken as a given. Well, well, I cer certainly don't see it as an advantage for our pupils. I see it as a disadvantage because it threatens both the good teachers we have right now and the excellent teachers I can hire in the future. And I don't see that as being good for pupils. Our, our, we certainly don't pe take people off the street. The vast majority of our teachers are certified uh, from wherever they come from. Uh, we have professional development. We go through accreditation process. 
uh, which includes a self-study to point out things for us as a school to work on, uh, as well as the visiting team that comes through accrediting us to give us uh, ideas about what we might work on. Our professional development is aimed at that. Um, we have... Would it threaten the current status? Because you're saying that really we, that we, those we don't, teachers are already up to standard, do you believe? We don't so get how enough. Would it be we don't get enough. Uh, we have a hard time filling our positions as it is. And certainly, it would eliminate the opportunity to hire from overseas to add to the diversity in the international community to bring into our unique curriculum. So uh, most of our, our folks have teaching certification, but in a rare case, they, they might not. But in those cases, you, you go through evaluation every year. You put them uh, in a mentoring program, and we just had someone with a, a teacher with 28 years' experience and 10 years' experience as their mentors I would argue that you can't get much better professional development than in a teaching profession. We don't just have them go out there and, and go it alone. They're experienced and they have uh, expertise in a particular field, and they do a fantastic job for our pupils. Who would be, and they've also committed themselves to our school. They've made commitments to live in Scotland uh, and to have the rules change where they have to go back to school or give up their jobs, I think is entirely unfair and detrimental to the pupils that we have now because they're excellent. I mean, obviously we've read the submissions and, and when you're saying you couldn't attract people from abroad, I mean, why would that be the case that you, that you couldn't do? Because clearly that happens across the world. There's, there's different registers that teachers are on and you have to make requirements. So, so why would you be unable to recruit and why would people have to then give up their job um, given that there would be a process that, that lead into that? You'd have to have a process for them, right? But they're, they're teaching, if, if we have them already, they're teaching full time. Their focus should be on their pupils and, and going through the professional development we have. As far as recruiting from afar, if they have to be registered with GTCS, they're not going to be registered with the GTCS. There would at least have to be a process over a couple of years for them to be allowed to, to get that process done. And I would have to, while I'm recruiting them, be able to give them a degree of confidence that their teaching certificate's going to be accepted here. If, if I can't give that, they're going to take one of the many, many other jobs around the world rather than take the chance on whether uh, they're going to be accepted here. Am I permitted to, to read um, something from a member of my staff who have not submitted of course. prior to us? So this is um, a gentleman called Dr. Richard Phillips, um, and he wrote this to me yesterday, knowing that I was coming to see you today. And I think it illustrates the points that we are making about the difficulty of being GTCS registered when you've been teaching or you're teaching experiences in other countries. In 2012, I moved from Yorkshire to Edinburgh with my wife, who'd been offered a promotion within the NHS. At that time, I continued to work as a university lecturer at Leeds, but eventually decided to return to school teaching, having previously taught for 10 years in challenging schools in London. I'd also worked for 10 years in the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and Berkeley, California, and was excited to take new knowledge and experience back into the classroom. My first hurdle was to become registered with the GTCS. I had no experience in the Scottish sector and was surprised to discover that my PGCE and 20 years in the education sector did not qualify me to teach science in a Scottish state school. If I were returning to teach in England or Wales, I would only need to apply to the school in question. However, I duly examined the 16 web pages on the GTCS website that concerned registration, downloaded and read the 14-page registration form, the 23-page registration and standard rules, and the five-page statement of principles and practice for applicants qualified outside of Scotland. I then wrote to the four universities at which I studied in order to get copies of degree certificates and exam transcripts, and the process of receiving all of the documentation took several weeks. Having what I thought was all the necessary paperwork, I submitted my forms and paid the processing fee of £60. A few days later, I received a letter stating that my application was incomplete because as I had worked for the University of California for two years, I needed an overseas police check. Obviously, I had not registered this when reading the overwhelming documentation. The GTCS letter stated that I had 30 days to get the US police check, otherwise I would lose my processing fee and all of my forms would be destroyed. There was no advice in the letter on how to get a US police check though I did eventually find a note on the GTCS website direct, directing me to a Canadian visa site which proved useful. After further research, I worked out that I needed to get my fingerprints taken by the Met Police and pay them £72.50, then complete a form for the FBI, FBI and pay $18. The earliest appointment I could get with the Met was just before the 30-day deadline set by the GTCS. 
Obviously, the FBI would not be too concerned about my need to submit my police check before the allocated time, so I phoned the GTCS. I explained the situation to the help desk and was met with what I can only describe as rude derision. The basic message was that I had 30 days with no extension and loss of my processing fee, regardless of the issue. After putting paperwork together for several months, spending over £150 on transcripts, processing fees and fingerprints, I was coming to the conclusion that GTCS was an arcane, bureaucratic body that did not care too much for outsiders and was seemingly not interested in recruiting from outside of its limited club, regardless of experience or talent. The fact that there was no flexibility to extend the deadline is nonsense given the circumstances, and I don't think I have ever dealt with such an intransigent organisation. For newcomers, the Scottish system appears complex and opaque. The GTCS do little to simplify registration and, in my experience, are certainly not welcoming. And ultimately, I decided not to register. I remain a dedicated and enthusiastic teacher and I'm lucky to work in a friendly and inspiring school with children who seem to greatly enjoy physics. My experience with GTCS has not been constructive or pleasant and I remain confused as to what the benefits of joining are. Being a member will not make me a better teacher and a PVG check seems to cover issues of child protection. By the way, this gentleman is a world expert on plate tectonics. Hey, Mr Grant, thank you for that. Mr Muir, I think maybe you want to respond to I do, to that. yes. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I, mean, I think it's probably worthwhile pointing out initially that any suggestion that GTCS doesn't register teachers from other parts of the United Kingdom or worldwide is quite inaccurate. I mean, in the last four years, we have registered 594 teachers from overseas countries. In the last four years, we have registered 1,006 teachers from England alone. Uh, so to, to suggest that somehow or other we don't register teachers or, or that we disadvantage teachers who are applying from England or from overseas is, is actually quite an outrageous suggestion. The evidence is there to show that we do it. Uh, what Mr Grant has referred to, I, I can't comment on the specifics because I'm not aware of it. I don't remember any complaint coming into GTCS from either the school itself or from the individual, so uh, I can't comment on that. I think we try and process as quickly and as effectively as we can. Uh, it's, it's certainly the case that where there are overseas applicants, uh, and I think it's only right that we take criminal records checks and police checks on the individual to satisfy that they are uh, fit for purpose to be put in front of children uh, in Scottish schools. I think we... Uh, the processing is not entirely uh, uh, in terms of GTCS's timescale at our own hand because part of the PVG checks can uh, take time. Uh, equally, we require references as part of the application form and sometimes we ourselves sit and wait for months for referees who have been uh, cited within the application form to get back to us. So whilst I would accept there are individual instances where an individual teacher who is applying for registration may find delays, the reality is that we process the vast majority of them uh, very quickly and very effectively. And we do that for folk who are coming from England and we do that for folk who are coming from overseas. It's unfortunate that Mr Grant's uh, uh, teacher, Mr Phillips, uh, met that. I apologise for that. I, I'm, I'm not aware of the, the circumstances surrounding it, but I think it is important that we go through those processes in order to satisfy ourselves and also to satisfy the users of the education system in Scotland, the, the, the people that we're putting in front of these children are high quality and who are also trained in that complex profession of teaching. As I said, it, it, we have in the past had teachers who have been unqualified within the Scottish system. And we've, we now have a system where it is, it is a rigorous system and it's a demanding system in order to get into the teaching profession in Scotland. That is because teaching is difficult. And we go to the ends of the earth to try and ensure that teachers who are able to teach go through that process in order to give that reassurance at all levels. And I think it's worthwhile also just commenting that part of what we have been doing within GTCS over the, the last six months or so since the, the bill has, has, has been in place, is to work, as Nicola said, with all partners in the system in order to try and find a way in which the very teachers that uh, Mr Grant and Dr Hovda are talking about can in fact be registered with us. Uh, and it may very well be that one of the ways in which we do it, and the submission I made to you, shows very clearly a number of ways that uh, teachers can be given either conditional registration or provisional registration, or we're, we're, we're working to ensure that teachers who are coming in without the requisite qualifications 
can be facilitated through GTCS in order to get those. So there is a lot that's happening out there, but I think fundamentally we need to be guaranteeing to the users of any education system, whether it's in the public sector or in the independent sector, that those teachers both are academically high qualified, but also are able to, to deliver in the complexities of teaching. Thank you very much for that. It, just on then the basis of that discussion and the evidence that you've already provided, just to the three other witnesses, uh, Mr Muir, would it be fair to say that you haven't revised your opinion on the, your opposition to the registration? Given that we've had 14 other submissions that are in favour of this, you've had discussions with the Scottish Government, you've said through well, your part of the working group things have moved on. Ha has your opposition to this moved on or, or are you still opposed? I think it's fair to say that the majority of independent schools that we speak to are not against, in principle, um, full registration. They accept the, you know, the value of being registered with a re regulatory professional body um, and the recognition of the professionalism of their teachers that that brings. But the challenges have been with registration. Um, and indeed, schools have been moving towards full registra registration for the last 15 years and now up to a significant number of registered teachers. And in many schools, it is almost full registration. But when those discussions took place 15 years ago, there was that understanding that there would always be exceptions because of the unique na na nature of some of the curricular provisions, the curriculum programmes in place, the provision of some subjects which are not recognised within the, the GTCS categories at present. Um, as examples. Um, but we do have numerous examples of teachers who have sought registration, who've wanted to be registered, but have not been able to get registered. And in some cases, it is hard to understand why, why that is when, to all accounts um, from schools and all evidence, they are excellent teachers and highly competent teachers. And it would be a great shame and a great loss to those schools if their ability to cast the net wide in their recruitment was restricted by um, restricted, uh, restrictive uh, regulation categories. But we do welcome the discussions that have been taking place there. But just to give a couple of examples, um, uh, an individual BA Classics in Cambridge, from Cambridge, MA in Classics from King's College London, went through the Graduate Teacher Programme, came out with Outstanding. That's a, a programme which is not uh, recognised by GTCS. Um, is currently undertaking an MSc in Learning and Teaching at Oxford, and the GTCS has still been unable to confirm whether she'll be eligible for registration after all that. And these are teachers who are professional, who are diligent, um, and who um, seek that, that recognition of their registration um, and of their professionalism. Um, Another example, a teacher trained in English, experienced in English, um, 24 years of teaching experience, has undertaken a further MED in learning support, um, applied, was taken on in a support for learning department, and when she sought registration, she was told she had to complete her probationary period in English, although she had already a lot of experience in English behind her and was then employed as a support for learning teacher. So it's just we urge that flexibility around the, um, the registration requirements. There was a system in place um, exceptional admissions route, which worked well for a while, um, which took away um, some of the, seemed to, to be manageable for schools, and it um, took into account where there was a shortfall in academic um, content within the degree or in teacher qualifications, teacher experience was taken into account to make up for that shortfall, and that worked well for a number of years, but the decision was taken to, to, to remove that option, and since then it has been increasingly difficult for teachers, particularly from outside Scotland, and I would say particularly from England because of the range of qualifications that they come with um, to be recognised. Uh, I'll mention the background checks just because of where some of our folks are coming from. We, we do background checks. We have a company out of the States that does background checks both through the FBI and, and overseas. If, if people are required, I mean, if you think about some of our, our folks, and even myself, coming from Indonesia, trying to get background checks done there, or uh, pick on somebody else, uh, Pakistan, G good luck running those down. Yeah. It's not going to happen, certainly not going to happen within the time frame. Our, our head teacher of our lower school tried to go through the FBI process and uh, ran out of time. Yeah. They weren't able to do it. So that's a concern that, that there be some flexibility that way. I think the experience piece is a key element. If somebody's been doing it and, and has a proven track record, um, I think that should be taken into account. Uh, and just to clarify, with our recruiting process, uh, it tends to happen between November and February to give people enough lead time to, to get ready to, to move from the country they're in to Scotland, to Aberdeen. Um, we'll have an opening come up, and it's posted out there, and I try to get people's attention. 
Sometimes they try to get my attention if they think, uh, if they're smart enough to know that Aberdeen's a great place to be. Um, but I would have to be able to give them with a great deal of confidence before they quit their job, sell their home, and get ready to move overseas, that they are going to be accepted, uh, to be registered, to come over and do that, so that, that I'm being honest with them and they can weigh their options against other job offers they have around the world. A number of members who want to come in. Uh, first of all, George Adam. Vineyard, good morning. Uh, I'm having difficulty understanding this process here. My question is probably more from the people from the independent sector itself. You know, why should we not uh, have uh, teachers teaching in your schools that are in line with mainstream education where they are registered? Why would we have uh, unqualified teachers teaching classes? When I mentioned um, an unqualified uh, member of staff, I was talking about one out of 67. Um, I have no problem with uh, uh, registration of individuals if that registration is straightforward. I am passionate about two things. I am passionate about education and I am passionate about Scotland as a nation. And I think people coming from out with into Scotland f find it, as I have read out, a, a really great struggle to become registered. These, by the way, all of these examples, these are qualified teachers. They are qualified in their own country. And Scotland is somehow suggesting that their qualification is not as good or that it has to be pr proven. Um, and the hurdles that they have to go through with academic transcripts and degrees. And, I mean, it, I, I'm confused personally by the rationale and the motivation for this. I, I don't understand what the rationale is to be registered. I'm interested in, in people who are good teachers and they are come with stacks of qualifications, including teaching qualifications, and then struggle to become registered with the GTCS. It's not because they don't want to be registered, it's because they struggle with it, and they find it, they find it intransigent, and the word opaque. Anyone else? I think that, that would sum it up for me also. I think in our case, um, we're, we are hiring highly um, skilled people, uh, we have a demanding uh, population that we're trying to serve. Uh, certainly within the oil and gas industry, you know, they talk about the oil patches small around the world. Uh, word of mouth reputation of the school at a certain location goes quickly. So we have to be top notch. And, uh, and it's for delivering our unique curriculum. We run the International Baccalaureate Program and run our curriculum backwards from that. And uh, so we have to make really good decisions about the people that are certified teachers that are good at delivering that type of curriculum. And independent schools are independent in the sense that they're autonomous in learning and teaching, curricular choice, examination choice. And as I've said, they, on the whole, they, su they support the full registration of teachers where it is possible. But in trying to provide what they see and they've judged to be the most appropriate curriculum for their, their body um, and their pupils, there are some categories where it is not possible. An example is classics teaching, um, where at the moment there is, a, there is a, a lack of classics teachers because there is an absence or there are insufficient um, classics teacher training programmes. There's none in Scotland at currently and there's two in England. Um, if schools wish to and they very much wish to continue to provide this this uh, subject then they have to appoint um, non-registered teachers if there is a dearth of uh, uh, registered teachers um, and they're they're always seeking to appoint the best person for the job um, and if that means they have to go out with Scotland um, to recruit um, then then that's um, that's within their autonomy um, in order to provide for their pupils. Um, I should at this point also mention special schools, um, where special schools um, have wide-ranging needs amongst their pupils, um, very specific needs in some cases, and it's the skills and attributes of, a teacher, of the teachers which enable them to, to meet those needs. A lot of those teachers struggle to get register if they, registration if they haven't been previously registered in a mainstream um, primary or secondary category. Um, if those teachers then um, you know, seek registration, they've been told that they must um, go and complete the probationary period in a mainstream environment. And yet that's not appropriate where they've made that choice to support those pupils in the special school. Mr. Muir, can you possibly answer some of these challenges that seem to be coming up about registration? Can you tell us, uh, uh, is there an issue? What is the issue and how can we deal with that? I think, uh, first and foremost, I would suggest that, you know, already, as Nicola said, 
we estimate that over 90% of teachers in the independent sector are already registered with GTCS. So clearly, over the years, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, those head teachers and the independent sector more generally have seen the advantages of registration. It hasn't been compulsory up until now. Uh, and you've got to ask the question, why then have schools decided that there are benefits to accrue to teachers and to the youngsters and to the parents who are, who are paying money for their children's education? What, the, the, there must be something that's beneficial to them, and I've suggested what some of those benefits uh, are earlier. The, the process of registration should be a relatively, and for very, very many folk, is a relatively straightforward process. Uh, as I say, there, there sometimes are delays in, in uh, receiving re uh, references from, for, uh, to support registration. Uh, there are sometimes uh, delays at the PVG check stage. Sometimes it is very difficult to get uh, criminal records checks or police checks on individuals coming into the country. Uh, where we can, we, we, we do so. Where we can, we're very then de dependent on attestations, character references and so on in order to allow teachers to take part. This is, not, this is not an attempt, and I don't think the bill is an attempt, to try and remove current teachers in the independent sector from their jobs. That's certainly not what GTCS sees as being uh, the, 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 the role of, of the bill. And I think, as, as certainly Nicola is aware, since she serves in the group, we have, we have looked at what our registration requirements are, and in order to fulfil the transitional arrangements of the bill, we have uh, looked at already a, a number of things that have been talked about, like conditional registration. Uh, Nicola talked about uh, uh, exceptional uh, uh, registration. We're looking at all of these areas. We're also looking at ways in which teachers can undertake additional training if that is required. And only last year, GTCS accredited the first top-up training course for teachers who have come from England who don't have a teaching qualification. And I think we need to be clear about that. It's very, very easy to say that a teacher is qualified because they've had experience in a school. They do not actually have a teaching qualification. But looking at service in lieu or partly in lieu as part and parcel of one of the options that we have as part of the transitional arrangements. But we accredited the programme, the top-up training programme for teachers who are qualified out of Scotland at Northampton University, which allows them, by distance learning largely, to bring their teaching qualification up to the level that would be acceptable for registration in Scotland. We have two other English universities who are wanting GTCS to accredit their top-up programme as well, and we've got interest from certainly one, possibly two Scottish universities who are offering a similar kind of provision. So we're already been very proactive in trying to ensure that teachers who wish to uh, teach in Scotland and be registered to teach in Scotland and who want to increase their, their, their teaching qualification to a level that automatically gives them registration, we'll We've, we've begun to put the, the, the steps in place to allow that to happen. As I say, we, we, as, as, a, as a working group, we have taken on board the 15 different categories of teacher that apparently exist within the independent sector. Uh, Nicola's own paper identifies those individuals. She's explained what some of them are. The job that we now have to do is how can we find a way in which we can register those individuals, not necessarily for full registration. It may be entirely possible in the International School in Aberdeen, for example, to have some form of restricted registration that restricts them to teaching in that school. We have that provision within our order. Or indeed to the independent sector uh, as a whole. These are all options that are open to us. Previously and in the past, they haven't been options that have been considered by GTCS, but they are now. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> the Maastricht, EU Maastricht Treaty in 1992 brought in uh, the free movement of uh, people within uh, the European Union and, um, uh, and also the harmonisation of qualifications, for professional qualifications. So, you know, is there a difficulty with a, uh, a teacher registered in Scotland? Does that teacher have the same problems? when they go to England, Wales or Northern Ireland? Or is it easier to go to another European country? I mean, if we've got the free movement of labour, harmonisation of qualifications for 23 years, why are we sitting here arguing that a teacher in a country of 5 million can't teach within the same United Kingdom without getting 
uh, another qualification. I don't understand that. There is no difficulty at all, Ms Scanlon, in uh, teachers who are qualified in Scotland uh, being registered to teach in any other country. So a teacher can go from Scotland and pick up a job anywhere in England, Wales or Northern Ireland mm -hmm. yeah. with no problem? Mm -hmm. well, no. The, 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 the stand they have to. No. Gordon's answering my questions. Could I the mind if the witnesses would answer? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that that, that uh, a teacher so qualification. They have to go through the it. same process. Well, they would have to apply. Uh, there isn't. A, there isn't a general. There isn't a general teaching council in England, as you're probably aware. But yes, they would need to go through a process with what was the General Teaching Council in Wales, now the Education Workforce Council, or GTC Northern Ireland, the Teaching Council Ireland, they would have to go through a process in order to satisfy them. But the qualifications that they have as a qualified teacher in Scotland would not be in question. Right. So are you, if somebody was a, a registered and qualified teacher in England, why do they need to... Do they have to go through the same process either side of the border? It seems to be that what I'm hearing it's more bureaucratic and more time consuming coming from England. And the reason I ask, <coughs> Convener, is uh, in Murray, uh, several schools had to send children home in uh, February this year, and yet we had a queue of spouses and partners from RAF Lossiemouth who were qualified and experienced teachers in the English system, but they're only up here for three or five years. So the thought of paying four thousand or two and a half thousand pounds to get registered, but you know, they were qualified teachers on the doorstep, but Murray Council weren't allowed to employ them. So it's from that point of view I want to ask as well. Well, those specific teachers did not have a teaching qualification. They had teaching experience. They had either come through the graduate teacher programme in England, which doesn't lead to a teaching qualification, or they had come they were uh, they had qualified teaching status, which again doesn't necessarily give them a teaching qualification, and that is one of the two elements that is required for registration in Scotland. I'll go back to Murray Council. That wasn't the way I understood it, but I'll go back and ask. Um, I think yeah, Nicola wants to come in. Our experience is that teachers from England are probably the group that struggle most with registration. Graduate teacher programme was, was mentioned there. And I accept that GTCS has the you know, conditions on, on registration, but to all accounts, these teachers are experienced and the testament from the schools are saying that they are high-caliber teachers. An example, another example, GTC Wales, there are a number of teachers in Scotland registered with GTC Wales because they were not able to re-register with GTC Scotland um, and that went through as a smooth process. So there are differences in, in registration expectations. Say that again. So a teacher that was registered teachers in England who have been able to could register, register with, with Wales and that made it easier to teach in Scotland? Not to teach in Scotland. That was for a requirement of registration with boarding staff, um, where they were required to be registered with a regulatory body, either with the GTCS or with Scottish Social Services Council or another regulatory body. Um, and teachers previously who were registered with GTC England, um, that would have met those needs. Um, but when, then when the GTC England was... Um, dissolved then GTC Wales was, was an option. So there are differences between registration with the different councils. Okay, my second question is the policy memorandum talk about the benefits uh, of, of what we're looking at today, uh, paragraph 98. There is a clear relationship between poor teacher quality and weaknesses in the provision of education, so that's why uh, we're discussing this today. Now, your paper from uh, Nicola, the Scottish Council of Independent Schools, uh, you say that the, the pass rate for national fives was 97%, uh, for hires 92%, and 93% for advanced hire. So where is the poor teacher quality that needs to be addressed in the provision of education? And in answering the question, could you also say, should we be equally concerned about further education I come from that sector. It certainly wasn't a necessity to be teacher trained at that time. Uh, and are our universities at risk of failing because they're not teacher trained? As I've already said, the professionalism of teachers is, take, is of given utmost importance in the schools. I'm the trying emphasis, to find where the problem of on, this poor teacher quality is. Emphasis on teaching is. and learning is, is very high, and the results bear testament to that. And therefore, whilst 
you know, supporting the principle of full registration, we cannot see what necessarily what it will alter. That commitment is there and will continue. The commitment to the professional development of teachers is there. Um, the commitment to providing excellence in, in teaching and learning. There's nowhere to hide in, in there's nowhere for poor teachers to hide um, in independent schools with the scrutiny of external and internal bodies, um, high expectations of parents and pupils. Well, um, I know that, yeah. but I'm, I'm just trying to find mm -hmm. where is the problem? We know what the solution is, but Where's the poor teacher quality, given these pass rates? I'm trying, trying to find where it is. You're we asking, don't. You're asking the same question as I am. Yeah. What is the rationale? I don't understand the rationale. Well, where is it? Because uh, otherwise we're saying if um, registration is a legal requirement, that there must be an issue. There must be a problem with the teaching quality, because this is about teaching. That's right. For me, it's about individuals. What I want to see are people that can engage with kids, that are professional that will look after their own professional learning and don't need an external body in order to make them do that. Okay, my last, sorry. It's just about FE and universities. Is, Mary, is that no, sorry, no, sorry, Mary, uh, I can want to come in there. So yeah. Sorry, just specifically on that point, uh, yeah. Ms Scanlon. I mean, as some of you are aware, I'm a former Chief Inspector of Education and I have nearly 20 years of inspecting in independent schools. And whilst I would say generally the point that Nicola made about the high quality is prevalent across the vast majority of the independent schools. I think if you look at some of the reports that have been published recently by Education Scotland into independent schools, uh, they make quite interesting reading. They actually answer your question, Ms Scanlon. If we take a, a school uh, in Glasgow which was inspected uh, and reported on in the 28th of April this year, it talks about potential to build on the most effective practice to, to secure greater consistency in learning experiences across the academy. So that, to me, suggests that there is variation in the quality of teaching and probably, therefore, learning in that particular institution. Uh, I myself have experience of inspecting a school, an independent school in Glasgow within the last five or six years, which in the five quality indicators came out as weak, three satisfactory and one unsatisfactory. So I think whilst generally the teaching quality across the Scottish education system as a whole is good, and in some cases it's very good, and I wouldn't dispute the fact that that's the case in the independent sector, I think there is still variation within that. And you know, encouraging teachers, irrespective of whether they're in the state sector or in the private sector, to maintain their professional learning, to continue to develop their professionalism, which is one of the things that professional update and registration will require of teachers, I think is one of the ways in which youngsters get a, a, a better guarantee of a better deal uh, over the longer term. Can I ask a question there? Well, Ken, was there a correlation then between... No, you I'm can't not ask questions. Okay, no. sorry. That, that's what we do. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Scanlon. Yeah. Just my, my final point. Um, I, I understand that uh, it's not just teachers, but also school heads. Uh, given that the Scottish Government want all school heads to have a headship qualification, a leadership qualification uh, in terms of attainment, if there's going to be a, you know, a, a, a headship course in Scotland that has been passed, you've got to pass that in order to be a head of a school, um, how does that affect if someone was coming up from, say, England to be head of a school in Scotland, would they have to be go through the GTCS plus do another qualification in order to be the principal of a school in Scotland? I understand the details of that are still being still being discussed. Um, we would certainly. Uh, that's not in the bill at the moment. Um, my understanding it may come forward, and I think there are discussions ongoing. I think that's what Nicola has just indicated. So I'm not sure that we can we can be sure about w what that proposal will actually be. Okay, I'll just but, leave it there. Then. But I don't know if, if you want to add something, Nicola. I'm quite happy for you to do so. I think it's, just, it's fair to it's just say that clarity. there is at this stage there are a significant number of heads that are do come from out with Scotland. Um, who would not, prior to coming to Scotland, have access to, to a qualification as such. Again, the professionalism of these heads, um, many come from previous headships, um, have access to other professional learning opportunities, um, whether it should be um, one, the, the expectation that one qualification um, is appropriate, um, we certainly have our considerable concerns about that. And it is the remit of the governor's 
as trustees of the schools um, to choose the appropriate head um, to take the school forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can um, I just ask if, just a very quick question, Mr Grant? One final you, question, Mary. You gave us two pages um, outlining the example of someone who had a, a, a uh, first class honours from Cambridge in music. He'd been teaching for seven years, head of a music faculty for five, and you've outlined the process. The only thing that you didn't mention was how long did it take him, given his background, experience and qualifications, how long did it take him to get registered with the GTCS? Nine months. Nine months. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. I want to follow up that same point about we're being asked to legislate in an area, um, it would be helpful to have a clearer understanding of the problem that we're trying to address through that, that legislation. Um, I, I think, Ken, you cited the example of um, uh, investigations that have been carried out that demonstrated a variability in quality within the independent sector. I mean, frankly, the same argument could be made of the state sector where you've got the GTCS registration. So I, I think particularly given that there was no formal consultation on this, what I think as a, a committee would be good to get our, our head around, and it's probably more a question for the Minister rather than yourself, I, I, I fully accept that, but I, I think getting an understanding of where this has come from, where was the problem that was need, felt needed to be addressed, um, given that through an organic process of schools themselves and the individuals recognising that there was a benefit in many instances to get GTCS uh, registered. Why we've come to a point where up with this we shall not put any longer and we're being asked to make it compulsory across the board. Yeah, well, I think you're quite right in your first statement. I think it's probably best directed at ministers, but I mean, I can give you my best shot at it, Mr MacArthur. I, I mean, I think one of the things that's happened in the last decade in Scottish education generally, and it's not just in Scotland, it's across the world, that there are increasing expectations on this, what the education system will deliver, irrespective of whether it's the independent sector or the state sector. I think uh, there is greater recognition that teachers are having to deal with more kept complex situations within schools, uh, different types of youngsters coming into to schools. Uh, that the, the fast-changing expectations in the education system require teachers to constantly refresh and renew their knowledge, their understanding, their skills and so on. So I would suggest that it's possibly come on the back of that, that a recognition as a mm. whole that teachers who are expected to deliver high quality for the Scottish education system as a whole and all of the individual mm. sectors that make up that, sec that, that uh, system require to have some kind of uh, infrastructure through which they can be supported. And as I've tried to suggest, I think registration provides part of that infrastructure and professional update provides that guarantee to the users of the system that teachers are taking and developing that professionalism seriously. I, don't, I, mean, I wouldn't have said that's necessarily an, un, an unreasonable proposition, but I think what Siobhan McMahon suggested earlier, to some extent it runs in conflict with the recommendations coming out of the Wood Commission about expanding the availability of, of, of the expertise yeah. and allowing schools, both in the state and I suspect the independent sector as well, to draw on a wider range of, of, of expertise. Yeah, and, and I think the point that I made earlier is that you know, we're in a different world within GTCS as well. Uh, you know, we we have had registration requirements in the past which we recognise and my council recognise need to be reviewed. That's the process that we're going through just now. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that this bill and the proposals within the bill uh, are in alignment with what our council already mm -hmm. recognised needs to happen, and that is that we need to look at a wider range of routes and greater flexibility to allow teachers to become registered. And that's, that's mm -hmm. where we are, and these may, may very well be the outcomes of the working group's considerations in respect of registration independent sector. I mean, I think having unfairly asked your question, it probably should have been directed to the member, uh, to the minister. I, I, I would, I think, also be fair to acknowledge on a, on a local basis um, there appears to me to be improvements in the way that GTCS is dealing with those applications that, 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 that wasn't the case, say, four or five years ago. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, I think back to the point where there's been no formal consultation on these proposals, we're now seeing what appear to be constructive discussions taking place with SCIS and, and possibly with individual schools as well about how to make this work and yeah. make it work in a pragmatic fashion. But that only serves to, to underscore why in a parliament that 
prides itself in that, in fact, requires a degree of pre-legislative scrutiny and consultation to take place because we don't have a revising chamber, how regrettable it is that we found ourselves in the situation with um, this aspect of, of a bill not having been sort of put through that, that process before the bill is actually presented to us. So that what you're trying to do is retrospectively come up with solutions that don't undermine the quality of education provision within the independent sector. Yeah, and I think I mean that, 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 that's for uh, folk on the other side of the table to, to take forward. But I think you know members of committees should be reassured by the very constructive nature of the work that is being done by the working group and also by GTCS Council in order to facilitate registration and whilst increasing greater flexibility, which we recognise as a requirement, maintain a set of standards that you know you as Education Committee, users of the system, the public at large, expect of our teachers standing in front of children in Scottish classrooms. So it's a very careful balancing act that we are actually undertaking at the moment. But I think successfully and very constructively and, and in a strong partnership with the key players. So uh, you know, I think members of committees should be reassured by that. And, uh, and given that there hasn't been a formal consultation process, uh, take some reassurance from that, that we are working hard at our end to make it work. Mm. But I mean, it would be interesting to hear whether, despite there being a formal consultation, whether this came entirely out of left field or whether there were indications that something of this nature was, was afoot. But I mean, it does appear to me that if you're looking at a transition period of two years or, or, or if it's argued up to, to, to three years, that, that, that process or what needs to be achieved through that, that time frame is made more difficult by the fact that we're starting from where we where we are without a formal consultation, having fleshed out some of these these concerns and and identified the solutions to them. I think it's, it's fair to say that it didn't come as a surprise um, that um, we kind of saw it coming, but the time frame um, was, was unknown. As I said, we've been working towards full registration on the understanding that where possible, registration was was acquired. Um, and as Ken has said, you know, we have had positive discussions recently and constructive discussions about ways forward, um, and we would just urge that they are realistic and practical and proportionate to, to the nature of the teachers concerned, so that particularly when considering that transition period, not only in terms of the time for the current workforce, but keeping an eye on future recruitment, that it is possible to appoint somebody without GTCS registration subject to GTCS registration, because otherwise that's going to limit the pool from which a, t a school can employ um, when they're looking further afield. The Scottish Social Services Council, for example, have uh, an appointment subject to six months, within six months registration, subject to three years of acquiring the necessary qualifications or standard. Um, that kind of discussion, I think, needs to take place to, to enable, once the legislation comes in, um, recruitment not to be stunted at, at that stage. Um, I think we talked about, um, mentioned there, the, the, the range of provision within the schools and, and making sure that that isn't lost through any of this. And I think that's where we raise the issue of the, the clarity around teachers, so that anyone providing enrichment, further provision, supporting and enhancing the breadth and flexibility and enrich, enrich programmes within the schools is not subject to registration if that is not appropriate, um, so that schools do not have their programmes um, kind of reduced by having to go through the registration of teachers. Um, so clarity around the teachers, and I think with that in mind, it's important to stress that regardless of the role anyone plays in a school, child protection is um, of utmost importance. The procedures um, are, are in place, rigorous, in line with um, national guidance, and that doesn't change regardless of what somebody's role is in a school, whether they're a registered teacher or not. They all go through the appropriate PVG and Disclosure Scotland checks. Okay. Uh, before we move on, Gordon, you said you've got a very small supplementary uh, specifically on this. Yeah, a very quick question on um, registration. I'm just trying to understand the difficulties here because we've got nearly 51,000 full-time equivalent number of teachers in Scotland. We've got 90% of uh, independent school sector teachers are registered with GTCS. And so therefore I'm, I'm struggling, you know, Nicola, you already mentioned that there had been a 15 year transitional period. And I'm looking at the, um, UK government website this morning for 
qualify to teach in England, and it says teachers who trained in either Scotland or Northern Ireland must obtain qualified teacher status to take up a teaching post. And with regard to EU nationals, it says if an EEA member state recognises you as a qualified school teacher, you can apply for quality, uh, qualified teacher status in England. It then goes on to say it may take up to four months to process your application. So my question is, is there any jurisdiction across either the U UK or, or Europe that doesn't have um, minimum standards for registration of a teacher in order to teach? Mm, I think that's it. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, check yes, I, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, as it is now. Um, I'd like to talk about the transition arrangements, but before I do that, I wonder, Mr Grant, um, we all know, for, for children uh, who go to university here, people who come from friends who came from England, who uh, either had sons or daughters who attended university here, and when they graduated, like you, were passionate about Scotland, went on to teacher training, and <coughs> uh, got their GTCS to allow them to teach that's English students coming here. How does that sit with your view that this recommendation is politically motivated and very anti-English? Um, I'm not saying it's politi politically motivated. I'm not saying it's anti-English. I'm saying it is extraordinarily difficult for teachers who are out with the Scottish borders. It, it, you wrote it. It yeah. says it would appear to be politically motivated and very anti-English. I to think that bad. says more about you no. than it does about what we're talking about. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Right, I'm going to go with the transition thing. Can you tell me, in, in terms of the, the clearly the, with the costs that, that, that might be involved, that there might be an implication of concern that smaller schools may not be able to operate? How do you, smaller independent schools, how do you view that? Nicola? There are a number of smaller independent schools where, for example, small special schools, um, if there is a, if, where there's four to eight teachers, if there's a significant number that are unregistered, if there are difficulties with some of the, the options um, that do not allow for a smooth process to registration, they have to undertake further qualifications. Um, that is obviously a significant commitment to that school in terms of cost, in terms of time, both for the individual and for the school. Um, in terms of future recruitment, if that, if that is a continuing pattern, um, then that school would struggle, um, given the nature of the size. Um, there, it, it's worth pointing out that, the, that at other larger schools, there are also pockets of um, teachers who are unregistered and, and who may un need to undertake further qualifications. And again, where there are significant numbers, um, a transitional period of two years would be tight to allow that to happen um, in order to spread the commitment and the time and the cost. Dr Hobdy, your view? Daniel? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, for, for us, we've got uh, about 10 of our teachers that are are registered they're from Scotland they're they're local and they're uh, if we can pick up local teachers it's fantastic but we're also looking at a as an international school we're trying to have a fairly diverse uh, staff to match our diverse um, student body so so I think what we're looking at is trying to figure out well how do you how do you operate within the, the bill and looking for avenues to do that, whether it's to take advantage, you know, like the Murray case, take advantage of expat teachers that are in the area, have been in international schools uh, before and, and would like to work and in some cases um, fulfill. Maybe we have an emergency opening because of increased enrollment or something like that. Um, to be able may, to take sorry, advantage of sorry to interrupt. May I ask, you say you, you would love to pick up local, presumably GTCS, uh, registered teachers. What's the difficulty in doing that? We don't. Uh, I guess. I guess we're just a little bit different, so we don't get a, a, a huge number of applicants. Certainly, in the secondary school, we don't get a huge number of applicants. Uh, say nothing of uh, look, looking at the quality of the teachers. Just applicants. Uh, period for especially when you're looking at math and sciences, but anything in the secondary level, we get very few applicants throughout the EU. Do we know why they're not? 
apply? They just aren't. They just aren't enough. Nicole. I think another example um, you asked about small schools is the Steiner model, um, where a significant number of those teachers would not be registered. Um, many of them will have the Steiner qualification, which isn't currently rec recognised by GTCS. Um, and I, it is hoped that that would be an example of a category which would be appropriate to have a second, second a supporting category for Steiner teachers, which would enable them to, to register, meet the requirements of the bill, um, but co to continue within Steiner education. Um, it is an internationally recognised curriculum. Okay. Um, and that, that's an example of where a small school, that would have a significant impact unless there is a, a route found um, to, to enable those teachers to register. Okay. One last question, if I may, for, for, for Ken. In terms of, you said that there are conversations now going ahead, but how... What role is the Scottish Government playing in these discussions between you and the other parties? We meet regularly with uh, Scottish Government officials uh, to provide them with an update on the work of the General Teaching Council. So uh, they are aware of the decisions that have been taken at Council. There are Scottish Government observers uh, who sit on our Council who are aware of our review of our registration requirements. I report back to them as Chief Executive uh, quarterly uh, or at, at Council in terms of the review of our registration requirements. So uh, we are directly uh, linked in with Scottish Government policy uh, colleagues in order to uh, take this forward. And maybe just make the point that the, the sorts of things that Daniel's talked about there, and, and, and Nicola in particular, uh, are part of what I see as being very feasible transitional arrangements, whether it be awarding some kind of provisional conditional registration uh, or whether it be providing an opportunity for them under to, take, uh, to undertake some kind of uh, top-up training. Uh, I think given the time scale that some of those might require, I, I, I would agree that two years is probably too tight and that three years is probably a better time scale, uh, scale to introduce the transitional arrangements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. I've just mo most of what we're going to discuss in the area has been covered through the discussion already, but one thing I wanted to come back on was what you said, Nicola, about the, there was concerns about smaller schools might not be able to operate, and you, you gave the example of Steiner schools. Can, can you highlight what the, the difficulties are or what the problem is with uh, people or teachers who have the Steiner qualification, why they're not becoming recognised by GTCS? I think that would have to be a question. Yeah, but GCCS I mean, there's obviously a would, would perception answer, from your side. Um, but certainly, the majority, having spoken to the Edinburgh Steiner School just recently, um, the majority are not registered. Most of them have the qualification. If they don't have the qualification, I think there would be a willingness there to to undertake it. It meets their needs. Their curriculum, even their curriculum subjects, um, would not, as an individual categories, fit into GTCS subject categories. Just the nature of the curriculum, um, and therefore, I think that's an example of where individual recognition. Um, but I should say, on the other side, that whilst we support um, the steps being taken to to meet the needs of individual groups, on the whole, we would encourage full recognition um, and unconditional registration with GTCS for the majority of teachers, because otherwise, it limits transfer transitions between. Between schools, um, it's not in the interests of the careers of the, the individuals, let alone or the employers themselves. Um, so, it's on the whole, we would be pushing for for routes that allow for that that full unconditional registration, with the acceptance that in a couple of individual cases, um, individual categories would would be the most appropriate option. Okay. Okay. And we'd be very supportive of that. Yes, I mean that's very much the kind of direction of travel that the. GTCS Council wants to go down. I mean, we don't want to restrict registration, and we certainly don't see it as, as I said earlier, as a means of teachers who are currently delivering well within schools losing their jobs as a result of what, what's in the bill. So that greater flexibility that I think we're already showing, and Mr MacArthur suggested he's seeing at, at, the, at the sort of sharp end, mm -hmm. that's very much where we want to be, and ultimately uh, encourage full registration for everyone who's teaching in the independent sector. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Colin Beattie. Yeah, I just want to um, look at the definition of teacher and the issues around that. The Scottish Government suggests that a teacher is anybody who is employed to teach in a school and has the appropriate professional skills and knowledge necessary to enable them to undertake the teaching duties allocated to them. Um, is everyone clear what a teacher is and who is and who isn't covered in terms of this? It seems a simple question, but it looks like there's a definition here that could be at uh, issue. 
Nicholas touched on that, to be fair. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting as part of our review of our registration requirements is that we have been approached by instrumental music instructors uh, who are uh, actively seeking registration with GTCS. Uh, now, we know that there are about 750 across Scotland. We know that there are instructors within independent sectors who are not teachers, and that distinction is very important in the state sector because they're in different salary scales and such like. So I think there is an issue about uh, definition. I mean, our understanding of a teacher would be someone who is delivering a formal curriculum or an element of a formal curriculum. Now, we have teachers in both the state sector, but particularly in the independent sector, who are, uh, who are offering extracurricular activities, who, who perhaps go by different titles, job titles, to being a teacher. So I think there is a bit of clarity required around the definition of a teacher and who this bill uh, would apply to. I mean, it's interesting, as I say, this is coming at the same time as we are being asked by instrumental music instructors themselves uh, for voluntary registration because they recognise, and as do many of their head teachers in the state sector, that they are individuals who are uh, engaging very often on a one-to-one -one basis with uh, children and young people within their schools. And they're seeking that, almost that kind of sanctuary and reassurance that registration brings to themselves as professionals, but also as a guarantee to the public. Because it's very clear that if a teacher uh, is subject to uh, misconduct or is removed from the register for incompetence, then one of the big advantages and benefits of registration is the fact that that individual cannot go to another school in Scotland or indeed south of the border or indeed anywhere else in the world where there is a teaching council because they are on our record as having been removed. And that is a, a benefit and a guarantee to the users of the system. I'm a wee bit concerned that your definition is a little bit different from the government's. You're talking about delivering a curriculum or part of a curriculum. The government's talking about someone who's employed to teach and has the professional skills and knowledge. Yes. Yes, well, th that would be a prerequisite. The professional skills and knowledge is a, is, is a prerequisite uh, for a teacher to be defined as such. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And that's one of the reasons why we have the registration requirements that we have. They have uh, a degree or an equivalent. They have a teaching qualification. And in secondary, the, the subject that they are qualified in and they have their degree in uh, matches broadly the curriculum that they've been delivering in their school. So I don't, so, think, I don't think we're at odds in the, in the description. No, it's a, just sounds like you've added a wee bit on, that's all. I think I'm making the distinction between what I recognise as an issue in the independent sector, that there are some teachers who are perhaps not delivering a formal curriculum, but maybe largely involved in delivering caring or uh, extracurricular activities and not part of a, of a, of a, of a, a more formal curriculum mm -hmm. as it's traditionally understood. What about those that are coming up to retirement? Would you be thinking about exemptions from them? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, one of the discussions that we've had within the working group has been that we might limit registration to a particular school or a particular sector. And as Nicola said earlier, that wouldn't suit particularly younger teachers coming into the independent sector who might at some point see themselves going over into the state sector in the future. So it might be that there is no, there is no one particular answer to uh, the transitional arrangements. It's, it's probably going to have to be a kind of recipe or menu of uh, features that we put in place. And it may be that for a teacher, uh, for example, who might be coming only to teach in Daniel's International School, that we create a category of registration that limits them to the teaching in that particular school. So I think there are a number of very creative ways in which we can uh, adjust the register and uh, revise the register by creating new categories that would fit those teachers who are coming closer to retirement, who are unlikely to move out of their, 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 their school that they're teaching in just now, as well as meet the needs of young teachers who are coming into the independent sector who might want to keep as open a, a, a field as possible for their future career. It's been mentioned a few times that the number of teachers actually affected by this are very, very small. Mm. And indeed, the figure that I've got in front of me here is it's around 265, which in the, in the grand scheme, would you recognise that figure? I recognise the figure. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure we have an accurate handle ourselves as just to how mm. many uh, will be affected, but it's of that order. It's a relatively small number in comparison to those who are already registered. Mm. It is. And perhaps just one last question. Um, will this bill apply to staff in the independent sector nurseries? Where there are teachers in nurseries and, and all teachers, all nurseries um, have a number of one or, you know, 
depending on the size of the nursery, a number of registered teachers, along with the nursery support staff, um, who the nursery support staff would be registered with the Social Scottish Social Services Council. Where uh, there are teachers in employment, I would, we would expect them to be GTCS registered, yes. I think on the whole they would be registered at present. It's certainly not a category that's been, been brought up in, in discussions with schools recently. I think, I think it's also possibly, when talking about the numbers that we're talking about and trying to have a clear idea, SCIS is representing 72 member schools. There are obviously 100 independent schools in Scotland, and therefore there is a, a group that we at SCIS don't have a handle on um, the, the nature of the registration of, of teachers. Um, and within the 72 SCIS schools, there are 50, 50, 50 mainstream schools and uh, 22 um, special schools. The number, Nicola, I'm just going to ask you there, the number... Sorry, that, 52 and 20. The number that uh, um, Colin Beattie referred to in terms of an estimate of teachers who may be uh, impacted by this legislation, would you say it's roughly accurate? Would you recognise it? That, yes, we've been trying to get a handle on, on the exact numbers and it's still roughly 10 to 15% that are unregistered. Um, there are those who are going through registration at the moment now that they know that it is coming in and that number will therefore gradually probably reduce once they're clear about where they stand at the moment with registration. Yeah. But I think yes. The, yeah. the, the figure that Ken mentioned earlier was 90% roughly are registered. Mm -hmm. Of the 10% that's left, um, I presume some of them have the appropriate qualifications, they just haven't got registered. Uh, some others, there may be a little bit of work to do, but effectively they could be mm -hmm. registered relatively easily. What I'm what really asking about, what's left? What's the, kind of, what's the percentage of that 10%? What's the percentage left that really there's some difficulty with? I would say, yes, it's about half, about 100 to 150, who, if they don't have a qualification, partly because of historic reasons that they haven't required it and they've been in teaching for many years, um, but with any luck, these positive and constructive discussions and the options that we've been discussing will provide routes for the majority of them. Um, there certainly seem to be options out there. Um, I think there are also accreditations of programmes which are going through the independent um, PGCE offered by the Bucking University of Buckingham, for example. Um, there's about 20 staff in independent schools currently with that qualification and a number who are wanting to commit to the qualification and therefore that would immediately, if that was accredited, um, cater for that group. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mark, it's been covered. Been covered. Thanks. OK, I just wanted, well, I wanted to finish on one particular question because um, and I suppose it goes back to, to the point that was made earlier about um, uh, consultation or, or no consultation. And, and I think it's really about the discussion that seems to be emerging or seems to be taking place at the moment, probably in the working group, I imagine, Ken, uh, given the discussions. And it's not really a question for Ken, it's a question for the other three. Um, are you now, are, are you at this point uh, more comfortable with the kind of discussions that are coming forward? Ken mentioned some of them about registration on a basis of particularly, you know, somebody who could be registered to work only in uh, Dr. Hufti's school or registration that would effectively allow somebody to work in the independent sector or in a particular specialist Steiner school, for example. Are these options, which I know are not finalised yet, but are these options make you more comfortable with the fact if they are bottomed out and agreed that effectively the bill could go through as long as these are covered? Nicola. I think as long as some of the concerns about the, the processes, the length of time it takes to go through, the paperwork involved and the time-consuming nature of some of them, um, if that can be ironed out, um, I think we still have concerns that, that some of the options are still a, a certain level of... Um, it's complexity within them that could be simplified. Um, but on the whole, we do feel more comfortable and reassured by the messages that we're, that we're getting. Um, and I think, but I think it's remembering that heart of this is about the professionalism of teachers and not questioning their professionalism. Um, they are dedicated professional staff um, okay. with a lot of support behind them from the schools. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Hey, Dr. Hofti. Uh, I think for us, uh, hearing the numbers that aren't registered, it sounds like most of them are in my school. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think the case, I'd, ma I'd made the statement that there are just not a, enough people, uh, not enough teachers that, that are interested in applying our school. We've, we've got a great school and a, and a great place to live. It's not enough teachers are interested in an international school teaching our curriculum. Or, or a lot of times with our uh, local teachers, they, we just look a bit odd to them. We, they don't know what we're all about. When we do get one, they stay a long time. But I think most of our teachers, vast majority of our teachers, they're international teachers that come in 60% and more, 
they're going to be there five to seven years and they're moving on. They're going to move to their next assignment in another country and they've learned that they like international education, they like the, uh, the variety it brings and, and they've uh, made a life out of that. So it just hasn't applied to them. So I think what we're looking for is just a way that we can keep our school open and, and meet, the, meet the idea of, of what the bill's putting forward, but have a way of doing it where we can continue to bring in teachers from around the world uh, to bring diversity for our diverse student body. Okay. And teach our unique curriculum. Th thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Grant. Yeah, I, I just want the registration process to be simple. I'm not against registration, far from it. Um, but I am against the process and structures that are put in place because I think um, Nicholas' point is, is a good one, that uh, it does um, feel for many teachers that their professionalism has been questioned. And that's, you know, if you've been teaching for 20 years in three or four different countries and you've worked as a university lecturer and you're regarded as a world expert in a certain field and then to find difficulty in being registered, I, I think that's what's unfortunate. Okay. Um I don't, want to feel, I don't know if you want to make any comment on that, Ken. No, I think uh, the, the specific example that Rod gave you, as I said, is an unfortunate one. I think we can always pick out individuals who have a difficulty in registration. The point I would make is that not all of that, I hope I've made clear, is necessarily at the door of GTCS uh, in terms of the delays that can sometimes take place. But I mean, I'm very confident that the work that we've done has been very constructive to meet what we think are the requirements of transitional arrangements to arrive at full registration. And that may involve different categories being, being developed. Uh, we're, we're very much up for it within GTCS Council. And we don't see any major impediments in, in the proposals within the bill being taken forward for independent schools or indeed for grant-aided schools, whom we haven't mentioned much of, but the vast majority of teachers, mm -hmm. in fact, I think all bar two, are already registered with us anyway. Yes. I think that's probably why we it didn't come up. Okay. <laughs> we were aware of that. Uh, can I thank uh, all of you uh, very much for coming along this morning? Uh, we appreciate your time. As always, um, at next week's meeting, we will conclude our oral evidence session or sessions on the bill. We will be speaking to local authority representatives and, of course, to Scottish Government Minister. Um, with that, I close the meeting. Thank you.